everybody. It's good to be here, even though it's on virtual. But uh, my name is Rich Goldfarb. I'm a geologist. I'm also on the board of C2C Gold Corporation, one of the uh, companies working in Newfoundland. And I've also been involved with gold in the academic world for many decades. And what I want to do is talk to you today about Newfoundland and why it's so prospective. What in the geology about Newfoundland makes it so exciting for gold exploration today? And so I'll focus on two aspects to this talk. First, just what kind of gold is in Newfoundland and why? what are the geologic features of that gold that make it, that make large tonnage deposits? And then we'll look at Newfoundland and see why those features sit in Newfoundland and why Newfoundland is so exciting for gold potential. Gold's been known in Newfoundland for more than a hundred years. We can go back into uh, scientific journals such as Nature in the 1880s, where they've talked about some of the uh, gold bearing veins that were just discovered at that time in uh, the northwest corner of the central part of Newfoundland. Going uh, to more recent times, there are a number of publications by the Geologic Survey of Newfoundland and Labrador talking about gold resources in Newfoundland. So about 15 years ago, gold resources were recognized mainly in two types of deposits, massive sulfides and gold only deposits. Uh, at the time, maybe the estimates were just under a million ounces of gold resources in Newfoundland. And what I'm going to focus on today are the gold only deposits. They're what we term in economic geology, orogenic gold deposits. Historically, most of those that you see here are on the Bay of Verte Peninsula, but over the last 15 years, with exciting finds such as in Valentine Lake and on the Dog Bay line, more and more of these orogenic gold deposits have been recognized in the center of New Zealand, in the center of Newfoundland, along many of these major fault systems. And consequently, resources now are at least an order of magnitude larger. Also looking at the, this old report from the Newfoundland Geologic Survey, even back in 2005, we recognized gold in three types of mid, very different mineral deposits in Newfoundland. There are first what are called seafloor VMS deposits. These are base metal deposits that formed at the same time the rocks formed. And besides base metals, they have significant precious metal uh, credits also. And historically, some of these have been mined at relatively moderate scale in Newfoundland. And many of these occur in the same general rocks or terrains that have the orogenic gold deposits. Epithermal gold deposits are deposits related to granites that form at shallow levels. Normally, you don't find these in metamorphic terrains such as Newfoundland. But Hope Brook is the one example in Newfoundland of an epithermal deposit. And in the 1980s and 1990s, more than uh, a, a million ounces of gold was taken from the Hope Brook deposit here. Basically, Hope Brook uh, floated in from across the ocean, and we didn't erode the shallow levels of the crust that have this epithermal deposit. But for the most part, you would not expect these type of deposits to be abundant in Newfoundland. The type of deposits that are abundant in Newfoundland, that are down the center of the island, which is called the Dunnage Zone, going from the Bay of Verte Peninsula all the way to the Dog Bay Line, where Newfound Gold has its uh, recent uh, high-grade intercepts and many other com com companies are looking are orogenic type gold deposits. Valentine Lake is an orogenic gold type deposit. The historic mines such as Pine Cove are uh, orogenic gold deposits, et cetera. So that is really what is the deposit type that is leading to this present day gold rush that we see in Newfoundland. And that has 25, 30 or more companies excited about what they're finding and I think makes Newfoundland as perspective as it is. So first, 
What are orogenic coal deposits? Basically, they're just gold deposits in metamorphic rocks. They tend to be in medium grade metamorphic rocks, which are often called green schist facies. Most of these type deposits are steep fault fill veins or coeval extensional type veins, which form at the same time due to changing fluid dynamics. Generally, historically, these would be high grade type gold deposits, two, three, four, five grams per ton. Globally, as we can mine lower grade, higher tonnage deposits, many of these that are mined around the world now are less than a gram per ton. Uh, here on the lower right, this is Moro de Oro, the biggest gold deposit in Brazil. It's an orogenic gold deposit and it's 20 million ounces at 0.4 grams per ton. So we are mining these at very low grades these days. Really in simple thinking, there's two ways to form gold deposits on our planet. You can bring a granite up to shallow levels and either release fluid from the top of the granite or circulate surface waters. And then you can form porphyry deposits that have copper and gold at the top of the porphyries at maybe three kilometers depth or in the upper one, two kilometers, you can form what are called epithermal type deposits such as Hope Brook. That's one way we form gold deposits from magmatic or circulating meteoric waters. The second way we form most gold deposits on the planet, and this is the way we form orogenic gold deposits, as you bury rocks in the earth from the surface to depth, sedimentary and volcanic rocks change to metamorphic rocks. When you metamorphose a rock, three to 4% of that rock volume will change the fluid. That fluid will move into major faults. During earthquakes, the fluid may move up 500 meters or a kilometer and form your orogenic gold deposits. And these are the deposit types that we see along the faults in the center of Newfoundland that are the deposits that are the uh, all the new discoveries that we're seeing today. When we look globally and ignoring the exceptional historic paleoplasts of South Africa and West Water Strand, about 50% or about half the world's gold deposits are like Newfoundland, they're orogenic gold, the gold deposits formed during metamorphism, and the other half of the world's gold is mostly magmatic or intrusion-related gold, such as porphyry, epithermal, and gold-bearing scarn deposits. But this is the target type that we're seeing in Newfoundland. The orogenic gold deposits form as you have subduction, terrains are accreted to the margin of continents, and between the terrains as they accrete, we or get added to the continents in these sedimentary rocks. We form orogenic gold deposits along the faults. They can form to depths of 20 kilometers. This is different than epithermal and porphyry deposits that form at very shallow levels. So you can see without any amount of erosion, porphyry and epithermal deposits are quickly lost from the geologic record, while orogenic gold deposits, because they form deeper at 5, 10 kilometers, are better preserved back through geologic time hundreds of millions of years, which is the age of many of the Newfoundland deposits. So if we look at gold endowment versus geologic time, we can see most porphyry and epithermal deposits are 50 or 100 million years old. And that's where the gold endowment sits in these intrusion related deposits. There are a few that go back into the Paleozoic, very few into the Precambrian. But when we look at orogenic gold, it's distributed through geologic time all the way back into the Archean. So when we look at Newfoundland, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, and gold deposits that formed four to 500 million years ago, we're talking about orogenic gold deposits. These form in sedimentary rocks because those are the rocks that are added to the edges of continents and metamorphosed. And there are many world-class provinces of these, such as California Motherlode, Eastern Russia, Victoria, Australia, Otago, New Zealand, the Great Belts of Central Asia, etc. And Newfoundland has a potential to be one of these world-class gold provinces in uh, sedimentary type rocks. They do show 
a spatial association with seafloor massive sulfide deposits. And I'll explain why that may be important in a little bit. But you should know that seafloor deposits form in the middle of the ocean as the plates move to the edge of the continent. And we start having deformation and metamorphism. Deformation and metamorphism. These VMS, massive sulfide deposits, such as we have some in Newfoundland, I mentioned, have gold, also get deformed and metamorphosed in these growing continental margins. That's why there's a spatial association of seafloor massive sulfides and orogenic gold deposits. The two types form in different settings at different times, but they spatially overlap. Same with granites. There is a spatial overlap between granites and gold, but there is no genetic association. But granites are important, as I'll get to in a little bit, because they're good receptacles for good for gold. They're good host rocks. And you see this in places such as Valentine Lake, where Valentine Lake may be 430 million years old, but the 150 million year old intrusion there is a great host rock, and those are host rocks you may want to look for in geophysics in your covered terrain. When we look for orogenic gold deposits in Newfoundland or anywhere in the world, there are three keys for exploration, looking at structure, metamorphism, and traps. You need large structures to focus a lot of fluid, such as if we look at the Great Abitibi Gold Province of Central Canada and Ontario and Quebec, these are your first order faults, which bound blocks that have collided. The orogenic gold deposits sit along second and third order faults, a few kilometers to maybe 10 kilometers adjacent to these major faults. But you need to have large faults to have large deposits. If you don't have large faults, the fluids will go everywhere. You may have a lot of tonnage, but they'll be all low grade deposits. If you have large faults, the fluids are focused, and you may have your uh, Abitibi or Newfoundland-style gold. Along these faults, and we see this at Wilding Lake and Valentine Lake, we want to look for jogs or bends. This is the Great Fault in Western Australia that hosts the famous Golden Mile deposit. It strikes 155 to 165 degrees, but you can see the Golden Mile and the other deposits sit where there's a 10, 20 degrees change in strike along that fault that focuses fluid, and then the fluid can go off into second and third order faults and regional folds and form your gold deposits. So you want to look along these major structures in Newfoundland and everywhere else for changes in strikes along the fault, and you form these uh, uh, fault fill veins, the extensional veins, which we see in these orogenic gold deposits in Newfoundland and everywhere in the world. And we want to look along contacts. We see this very commonly in all the Newfoundland occurrences. If you have an intrusion and if you have sediments, we want to look along the contact because that's where you'll have your secondary faults and that's where the fluids will flow. And especially where you have structural complexities, complex geometry, you're going to form your ore bodies along the contacts. Here's another example from some work in by uh, workers in uh, West Africa. Here you can see phyllite on one side, you can see volcanic rocks on the other, and the shear that develops between these lithologies is where a lot of the mineralization is going to be concentrated. And you have that in Newfoundland again, it's no exception. Where these major faults intersect regional fold systems, anticlines, fluids can move up the limbs of the anticline, form gold along the limbs of the anticline, or on top of the anticlines where you have major uh, uh, faults develop along the axis of these fold systems. Maguma in Nova Scotia is very famous for these, although small, small scale. Victoria in Australia is famous, very famous for these at large scale. And I think Newfoundland, between many of the faults, we see many of these same type of anticlinal fold systems, making it very prospective for orogenic gold. Besides structure, the next thing that's important is metamorphism. Orogenic gold deposits sit in medium grade metamorphic rocks, mostly green schist facies, and most of the gold occurrences 
in Newfoundland sit in green schist facies. Why? Because as you metamorphose a rock between green schist and amphibolite facies, again, that's what three to 4% of the rock volume changes the fluid, and that fluid carries sulfur and gold and forms your orogenic gold deposits. Orogenic gold is basically a regional metamorphic fluid. It's a product of metamorphism. If you metamorphose the rock, you're always going to create a gold-bearing fluid that's going to form gold. And we can look anywhere in the world. We can look at Western Australia. We can look at the Abitibi. And you notice how most of the gold endowment sits in these medium-grade metamorphic rocks. Those are what you tend to target. So you want to look at structure. You want to look at metamorphism. And then we want to look at competency contrast which would be our physical traps. If you have a competent rock, like say a granite, sitting in a less competent rock, such as a shale or an argillite, the granite fractures more easily open space along these major structures, and that's where your fluid's gonna flow. For example, this is the Alaska Juno mine where I worked for many years. This is a large intrusive body. You can see the mine or at it here for scale. And you can see how 95% of the mineralization in these quartz veins sits in this intrusive body and not in the more ductile sediments adjacent to it. That doesn't mean there's a genetic association. This intrusion is 150 million years older than the gold, but it's something to explore for because it's competent and it soaks up that gold bearing fluid because it fractures more easily. That's what we mean by physical traps. There are also chemical traps, the great 40 million ounce home state uh, deposit in uh, South Dakota is an example of that. You can see these different rock formations, but you can see how all the 40 million ounces of gold sit in this one thin formation called home stake. Why? Fluids move up structures. When they hit this home stake formation, it's a banded iron formation, lots of iron. The sulfur that carries the gold in the fluids reacts with the iron. You form pyrite and arsenopyrite, and the gold that's moving with the sulfur drops out of solution. That's what we call a chemical trap. And many of the gold occurrences in Newfoundland are associated with iron-rich rocks like iron-rich gabbros that are good chemical traps. So you have good physical and chemical traps for orogenic gold, and Newfoundland has both of these types of traps. We see differences in deformation styles. We can see very ductile, cracked seal type veins. We can see very brittle breccia or stockwork type veins. We see all these in most orogenic gold provinces and Newfoundland is no uh, different than the rest. Uh, often people refer to shallow epizonal type orogenic gold deposits in Newfoundland, comparing it to Fosterville, Australia, but some of the mineralization isn't as brittle as Fosterville, and some would be mesozonal and slightly deeper, some of the Newfoundland mineralization. When you get very deep, it rocks are very ductile. You're going to have lots of replacement style mineralization, and you see some of this in Newfoundland, but you're not going to have big quartz veins when the rocks are not brittle. When you get very shallow, the orogenic gold deposits only form from 3 to 20 kilometers, and the upper few kilometers where there's no granites, the geothermal gradient's low, so you don't carry gold to shallow levels, but at 200 degrees, you may deposit massive stibnite. You get very shallow, you get cinnabar. Some of these stibnite occurrences that we see in Newfoundland could be the tops to orogenic gold deposits. Donlin Creek in Alaska, which is a large gold tonnage deposit, is a good example of, of that. And could some of these in Newfoundland be Donlin Creek type occurrences? So now, well, before I get to Newfoundland, one last slide. Tectonically, what we see in Newfoundland is so similar to so many of these productive orogenic gold provinces worldwide. Just for example, take Eastern Russia. Here we have the continent. Here we have a series of arcs that collided. Here we have a back arc area with marine sediments with a whole series of fault systems and orogenic gold deposits sitting along all of these. Some of these are plat alluvial, some of these are load, but together there's more than 100 million ounces of gold in here. This is the same kind of tectonic setting we see in the Cordillera of Western North America, and it's what we saw in Newfoundland 500 to 400 million years ago. So now let's look at Newfoundland quickly. 
and look at the gold and see how it fits the orogenic model. The uh, Newfoundland grew, grew basically from terrains that collided with the continent of North America between about 500 and 400 million years ago. And the gold, orogenic gold is concentrated in this what's called dunnage zone. There's a whole series of rocks here called the Notre Dame uh, subterrain or zone, which are including a bunch you include a bunch of rocks that moved along the margin from the north and sort of came along this fault line here and were accreted beginning 490 480 million years then we have a couple of more outboard terrains that actually came along these faults and collided and they came from Gondwana on the other side of the planet and they all collided here between 500 and 400 million years ago. And it's during these last collisions at about 400 million years when most of the gold formed along these faults at about 430 to 400 million years. So this is the area where the gold formed. And we also formed during this collision lots of other secondary faults, such as the Victoria Lake shear zone, that has the Valentine Lake deposit and Wilding Lake uh, prospect. Just one, two quick slides to show you what happened. These are the terrains that make up the eastern part of Newfoundland. They moved from Gondwana here on the other side of the planet over 150, 200 million years and collided with North America and collided with collided with North America to eventually form Newfoundland. The whole Brook epithermal deposit in Newfoundland that I talked about earlier actually was part of these terrains and migrated with these terrains across the ocean. It formed before Newfoundland formed. Eventually, these terrains became part of North America and here in Newfoundland and down to Nova Scotia, and then all the way through the eastern U.S., we formed orogenic gold deposits and later collisions formed these same deposits in northwest Europe, in the French Massif and the Bohemian Massif of the Czech Republic. So it was this growth of Pangaea and terrains, oceanic terrains, being metamorphosed in here that formed a whole series of great orogenic gold deposits. Just briefly... Many of these deposits in the United States were mined prior to the Civil War. But once the Civil War started, as well as gold being discovered out in California and then in Alaska and Yukon, all the great prospect is left. And the gold deposits here all seem to be small. They don't have great major structures. Same when we look at Magoomer here in Nova Scotia. There's a lot of high-grade, really nice-looking gold deposits but they don't have the fault systems that you have up here in Newfoundland. And along all these fault systems in Newfoundland, we're starting to recognize potential for significant gold. And actually, these, uh, this terrain, the Notre Dame zone here in this part of Newfoundland, can be traced up to the British Isles. And similar deposits have been recently uh, put into development in Northern Ireland and uh, southern Scotland. But here's what we have uh, when we look at this map from Sandman in 2017 in Newfoundland. This whole central belt is characterized. Here's the more historic orogenic gold deposits of the uh, Bay of Verte Peninsula. Here's some of the large fault systems and secondary fault systems in the middle of the Dunnage Zone, including the Valentine Lake Shear Zone. And we can look at these fault systems all the way over to the Dog Bay line. This is the same scenario we see in the Cordillera of North America, Western North America, that we see in the Russian Far East, and that we see in Victoria, Australia. And the potential is huge, I think, uh, understanding prospectivity between the different fault systems going to be important. It's taken a long time to recognize this because cover, uh, glacial cover is uh, quite extensive here in central Newfoundland, but certainly what we're seeing now makes the Dunnage Zone world-class perspective. As I mentioned, historically, the Bay of Verde Peninsula has been 
the uh, area where most of the uh, work has gone on in the 1980s and 1990s. Anaconda up here at Pine Cove and some of the adjacent properties has been mining about 15,000 ounces of gold over the last uh, 10, 12 years, both uh, replacement style and uh, 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 fault type mineralization. A lot of mineralization is along contacts between different units, what you would expect for orogenic type gold. And there's a couple of fault systems here that are very permissive. So far, most of these are high grade, but low tonnage. But at the price of gold today, a few high grade deposits next to each other are good things. The exploit subzone in the central and moving over to the eastern side of the dunnage zone here is really the area that's attracted a lot of attention. I've been involved with C2C recently, but certainly many other companies along here have had great success already, such as Marathon's uh, Valentine Lake with more than 4 million ounces, et cetera. These all reflect closures of these ocean rocks as terrains were accreted. These represent uh, rocks that were collided and closed, and we had reverse faults and shearing uh, up till about 400 million years, 430 million years. And then there was also some strike slip motion on these. And that's perhaps when some of the gold came in. We're looking at major fluid conduits, structural complexity, regional fold systems. And that's where we're going to find good orogenic type gold deposits. We can look at Marathon's uh, Valentine Lake. We can see interesting jogs along here. Again, that's where you're going to focus fluid. We have different lithologies here. We have lithological contact contacts, and that's where the gold is. That is critical. And I mentioned earlier VMS deposits, seafloor massive sulfide deposits. When we metamorphose a package of rocks, and there's a lot of seafloor sulfide in there, there's going to be a lot of sin sedimentary pyrite with high background gold. So it's a bonus when you metamorphose rocks that have uh, VMS deposits. That's why maybe the Abitibi is so rich. That's why maybe we're finding Egypt, Eritrea, Sudan, that region of East Africa now is becoming recognized as a very gold-rich area. It is a bonus to have earlier massive sulfide deposits as part of the package being metamorphosed. We can look at these slides from uh, Marathon Gold. Again, the host rock is a competent granite. It's not a genetic association, but looking for these different lithologies that are good traps or critical for finding these quartz tourmaline pyrite veins, such as we see at Marathon. Some people, the tellurides at uh, Valentine Lake, people like to say, oh, tellurides, it must be related to intrusion. That's not necessarily true. Many of the world's great orogenic gold deposits have, have significant tellurides. In fact, tellurides are recovered from the ore at the Kensington deposit in Alaska that has uh, uh, most of the gold tied up in tellurides. The Golden Mile in Western Australia has significant gold bearing tellurides. So it's not necessarily related to granite. So we look here, you can see the main shear zone on one of the Valentine Lake properties. And you can see how the mineralization sits in the hanging wall intrusion. It's a very favorable, competent rock. Another thing that I find very exciting, uh, this is from some of C2C's work that Sean Ryan, who you heard uh, one of the uh, previous days talk about, uh, glacial till. This area is under cover, but the till anomalies throughout this part of Newfoundland and over to the east along the Dog Bay line are very extensive. And they su suggest on the fault systems between these two regional fault systems, the uh, Red Indian line and the uh, Victoria Lake shear zone, significant gold potential along the complex structural geology here, which is if we look at, you can see from this uh, slide from Sandman in 2014, the Jaslin zone occurrence, we're looking at anticlinal structures. The Jaslin zone actually sits in these turbidites below sort of a black shale seal type rock right above it. But what's exciting is all these till anomalies sit where you have these regional fold systems. 
And so not just right adjacent to the faults, but these full systems associated with the faults are certainly exciting targets here in uh, this part of New central Newfoundland. A lot of the rocks are bleached and they're spotted, which are distal guides to looking for orogenic gold deposits. A lot of these show early albite alteration. Steve Piercy and some of his students working in Newfoundland from Memorial University talk about that. You albatize a rock, you make it more brittle, it fractures more easily. Widespread albite alteration that we see in here is critical. So there are so many exciting features here that you would expect to find in a large gold camp. And now we can move far to the east. And this is where the exciting Newfound Gold Queensway project sits. And many other companies are working now along the Dog Bay line and Grub line, sort of suture zone. And secondary faults along here have significant gold and till anomalies. Uh, a lot of results are very exciting. And we may have three or four zones here that have the potential to have serious world-class gold systems, and this would look then very similar to what we see in Victoria, Australia. One thing that sticks out to me about uh, this area of newfound gold, it's on the margin of this large batholith, which is slightly older than the gold occurrences that are being found in the drilling. The margins to batholiths give you sort of a structural regime where you have different stresses and very favorable areas to find orogenic gold. You can see this in orogenic gold all the way back to Barberton in Southern Africa at 3.2 billion years ago. The margins of these large batholiths in the adjacent sediments, very good for explorationists. So to summarize, why is why I'm excited about Newfoundland, why the company I'm involved with is excited about Newfoundland, uh, C2 Gold, C2C Gold, and why many of you and many of the companies that are there are there now. It seems to have all the right ingredients. It has favorable source rocks. You've metamorphosed oceanic sediments and oceanic sediments that have pre-metamorphic VMS deposits to add even more gold and sulfur into the mix. It has an exceptional conduit system of major terrain boundary sutures, second and third order shears off these, and a great regional fold system. And it has the complexity and lithology to have favorable traps. And a few things about orogenic gold that stick out. First off, if we look at these worldwide, so far, one giant deposit's been found here, and that is the Valentine Lake area uh, properties. But there's never just one orogenic gold deposit in a province, whether you're talking about Victoria, California, Motherlode, uh, Central Asia from Murrintau all the way to Kumta. You're going to find lots and lots of these. They occur together in provinces. So we would expect many million ounce deposits in an area like this. Second, we're looking undercover. So we're just beginning to explore and find these kind of deposits in a green fields area, which is Newfoundland. Historically, prospectors would find the largest deposit first, and that would be then other uh, favorable deposits would be smaller, but the same type. However, we're looking undercover. There's a large glacial till uh, covering here. So the largest first rule may not apply here. It may not be Valentine Lake. Using new tools of geochemistry and especially geophysics and uh, creative thinking in our drilling, we might find many other deposits and some could be bigger than Valentine Lake. I can look at say Kinross's Tassiest in Mauritania. That's the first one found again under cover, but it may not be the largest. So as we move our exploration under cover, the rule of largest first may not hold. And could this be the 100 million ounce province that we have in this Paleozoic gold belt that really stretches from Alabama to Southern Scotland? It certainly geologically has the best ingredients to form what would be a Victoria, Australia style or Eastern Russia style or a genetic type gold province 
that has been hitting, hidden under glacial cover for a long time and is now being recognized. And that's why I'm so excited about Newfoundland. So anyway, thanks for listening. And uh, certainly I'm glad always to accept questions over email or anything else. So thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. <music>